Today we're going to wrap up, uh, this is the last lecture for this course. Um, I'm going to talk about how you calculate the probability of error. Remember that's, uh, uh, that's kind of the equivalent performance metric uh, to the signal to noise ratio in analog systems. Uh, so what we're going to be interested here is how does the signal to noise ratio and the output of uh, the modulator translate in your ability to make a correct decision about what has been sent. Last lectures we kind of went through the whole process, how you receive the signal and turn the received signal into a vector, into a signal space. This is the process that we call the demodulator. And today we're going to talk about a second step that every digital receiver needs to go through and it's a detection process. A process through which you're going to map the point that you have received into one of the possible M symbols that can be sent. Now at the very beginning I said that we're going to talk about uh, the simplest form of the detection. We're going to detect one symbol at a time. Meaning that every time you receive a symbol, you're going to try to uh, attach, uh, attach uh, one of the constellation symbols to your reception. That's, there are different approaches where you listen to the whole sequence of symbols that leads into error control coding and much more advanced way of detecting, but that's left to a digital communication class that we also teach here. So first, uh, let me uh, kind of cover detection of uh, digitally modulated signals. AWGN and the white Gaussian noise channel. So this is the block diagram that we have been uh, kind of uh, talking about this entire time. Uh, we have SM of T. This is one of M possible symbols that is sent into the channel. The channel is AWGN. AWGN has two important properties. First, it is corrupted with additive white Gaussian noise. And that's an apparent property just from the channel name, right? But there's also another one that we don't talk about, but it's there too. And this is the assumption that the, the channel bandwidth is unlimited. Meaning that uh, the signal is not distorted by any other means, but just through the noise introduction. If I send a square pulse through AWGN, the square pulse propagates through the channel without suffering any uh, magnitude or, or phase distortion. That's not the true in most channels. Actually, almost all channels are band limited, but we'll have to worry about the effects that in some other course. But uh, remember, the, there's a noise, N of T, that's AWGN noise, and there's no uh, frequency selectivity on the channel. Now, our demodulator here is the first block and the modulator, as we've seen, it's gonna project your incoming signal R of T onto n possible uh, basis vectors, which we call pi one through, through pi n, which form the basis of this space. Now, in general, there are n of them in practice. There's usually either one or two. Right? One is in one-dimensional signaling, like a, like your uh, pulse amplitude modulation. But most commonly, there are two of them, which is true for all the uh, uh, modulation where you use sine and cosine or i and q components. Now, this vector here is fed into a detector. And the detector is going to make a decision on SM hat, where this is uh, what the detector thinks that it has been sent to. A lot of times, uh, actually we hope most of the times, the detector is going to be uh, correct and this estimate of what has been sent is, a good, uh, is the same as what has actually been sent. But sometimes the erroneous de decision will be made. The transmitter sent one and the receiver thinks it was zero. And what we care about here is to determine what is the likelihood or what is the probability of that happening. That's a fundamental metric of the performance. So let's just work through this. And in the first part, what I'm going to go through today is what I'm going to try to determine is what happens to this guy, right? How does this noise appear here, or more 
common is more appropriate to hear. What does the noise uh, do to this uh, signal R here? Because that's the major source of the of the reasons why this guy is going to make uh, erroneous decisions sometimes. So at this point here, I can say that R, which is my vector in a signal space, is going to be SM plus N. N is going to be my uh, vector of a signal plus N is going to be the noise. The, I can alternatively say this R of T, which is my signal, is going to be sum when uh, K goes from 1 through N, SMK, which is the projection of SM of T on the direction of the K uh, basis vector, and then plus sum K goes from 1 through N, NK times psi K of T, and plus sum NK prime of T. Um, this is, uh, you know, we're kind of working backwards, so this is k is equal 1 through n, snk plus psi k, oh sorry, plus nk, nk, multiplying psi k t, plus this n, n prime t. Um, this n prime of t, is n of t minus sum when k goes from 1 through n, uh, n of t, uh, I should say nk times psi k of t. This is the portion of the noise that exists uh, in the directions other than the ones that are spanned by your basis of signals. If you think about, let's say, modulating with cosine, this is the component that will be along the sine direction. These components are, n prime of t is orthogonal to the space spanned by these psi k's, and it can be shown uh, relatively easy that it bears no uh, influence on the decision-making process. Therefore, you know, we're going to neglect the effects of this n prime of t. So, what we really want to understand is what are the properties of this NK? How does this NK behave? And uh, let's just uh, look at some of these. First of all, what is NK? NK is the projection of this noise along the psi k, along the signal vector of psi k. So NK is a dot product between N of t and psi k of t. Right? That's a uh, that's a noise component along the k direction of the, in the signal space. Now, first thing that uh, I'm going to try to determine, what is the expected value? What's the average value of this guy? And I know this, uh, this is expected value. nk is calculated as integral from 0 of t, n of t times psi k of t dt. But here's where I realized that this integral and expectations are both linear operators, so I'm going to uh, exchange their order and operate the expected value on this. Out of these two functions, this is a deterministic function. That one is uh, not random, so the only expectation operates on this n of t. So this becomes the same as expected value of n of t times psi k of t. What is the expected value of n of t? This is uh, AWGN noise. What is, the, what is the property of this noise? What is the mean value of the noise? <coughs> zero. So this whole thing is zero. <coughs> because this uh, noise has a zero mean, the noise along every one of the coordinates is going to have a zero mean as well. The other property that is of also uh, points to us is expected value of nk times nm. Uh, expected value or, or cross correlation between nk and nm. In special case when k is equal to m, this becomes out of correlation, right? The measure of the power of this of this process. So formally this is expected value integral from 0 to t n of t1 times psi k of t1 dt1 
times. This is all under the same expected value, 0 to t, n of t2 times psi n of t2 d t2, right? So that's the product. This first integral is nk, projection of the noise along the psi k, and the second in integral here is nm, projection of the noise along the psi n, right? You can have uh, uh, various uh, basis vectors here. Now, just like I did it in this case, I'm going to change the order of integration here. So this becomes 0 to t, expected value of n of t1 times n of t2, psi k of t times psi m of t, dt of t1, t2, dt1, dt2. Just bringing the expected value underneath the integral. Now, let me ask you this. What is this uh, expected value here? If, uh, let's go continue here. What is the expected value of uh, this product here? This is AWGN. AWGN, what, what is the power spectral density of AWGN? It's flat across all frequencies, right? What is the autocorrelation function? For your transform of a constant, so what it is? What is it? It's a delta pulse. So expected value of the product of these two is going to be n0 over 2 when t1 is equal to t2, right? It's going to be 0 whenever t1 is different than t2, right? That's autocorrelation function of this noise. As long as, as you're separated, even the smallest amount in time, your autocorrelation becomes equal to 0. But when you're not separated, then it's n0. It's infinite, but uh, its area under the curve is n0 over 2. So this here, I'm, uh, uh, what I need to, what I forgot to do here, this is t1 goes from here. And then there's another integral when t2 goes from 0 to capital t, right? This is this first integral and the second integral, right? This is a double integral. So this becomes now integral when t1 goes from 0 to capital T, integral when t2 goes from 0 to capital T, and 0 over 2 delta of t1 minus t2. So this is this expected value. And then I have psi k of t1 times psi m of t2 dt1 dt2. This seems like a double integral, but like many cases before, this only uh, has non-zero values when t1 is equal to t2, right? Essentially, this is what is happening. You have, let me just do it this way. This is t1, this is t2. Both of them I'm integrating between 0 and t, 0 and t. But the only time when the sub-integral function has uh, non-zero value is when t1 is equal to t2, right? And that's on this on this uh, line over here. The subintegral function is zero, so I don't have to integrate. So this integral here can be written now as integral single <coughs> integral when t goes from zero to t, n zero over two times psi k of t times psi m of t t. And now we come back to the definition of these guys. Well, n0 over 2 goes outside as a constant. What is this integral equal to? It is equal to 1 when k is equal to m. And what is it equal to when k is different than m? 0. Why? Because the basis vectors are orthogonal. Yeah, exactly. Because they're orthogonal. So this I can write as n0 over 2 times delta m minus. So what does this mean practically, right? This, this is, uh, again, we're, we're running a danger of not being able to see uh, the tree from the forest here. Uh, here, in the first one, I proved that the noise along these components is going to be 0 mean. Here, I proved two things. I proved that the noises in individual branches are independent of each other. Why? Because when n is 
k is different than m, expected value is zero. So if you have two basis vectors, the noise along the first one and noise along the second one are going to be independent of each other. And the second thing that I proved is in a, every single branch, the second order moment variance, uh, in this case because the zero is mean, is equal to n0 over 2. Pictorially, here's what we have. kind of sketch. So let's, uh, so this is example, n is equal to 2. So here's my point, uh, Sn. This is what has been sent. And it is being corrupted with noise. The noise exists along both of these vectors. This is psi 1, psi 2. So there is noise component that will offset this uh, point in a north-south direction, and there's a noise component that is going to offset this point in east-west direction. So there I will be throwing, and my R's are going to be, you know, uh, follow, uh, getting to be around this component. The first uh, property here says that if I look at it east-west, there's going to be, uh, if I look at it north-south, there's going to be the same amount, number of points, or the probability of being above is going to be the same as probability of being below. If I look at it east-west, probability of being left is going to be the same as probability of being right. This one says that there is no correlation between these two components. You know, the, the fact that I'm east-west doesn't say anything about uh, uh, north-south direction. And this gives me the power of the noise in every one of those directions. So if I go back to what does this scatter here look like, it's going to be like uh, spherical, right? It's going to be, in this case, circular because it's two-dimensional. And the density is going to be the strongest in the middle. And it's going to kind of level off as, as you move away from this point. Imagine, remember the guy throwing the dart? Even as he gets drunk, his, his ability to, to kind of be unbiased is still preserved. He's mostly hitting the point, but his scatter becomes bigger and bigger, right? And it's, and it's unbiased in all directions, so it's kind of spherical around this point. So that's what we obtain by assuming that it's KWGN. Therefore, The, I guess, summary of these two results uh, is provided in <coughs> a very simple statement saying that the k component of the noise, the component of the noise <coughs> along the k basis vector, follows the distribution PDF of nk, which is going to be equal 1 over square root of 2 pi times sigma n to the minus nk minus mu k squared over 2 sigma n squared. In other words, we're concluding first thing that the noise is normally distributed. The second thing that we conclude is from here, from the first property, I know that mu k is equal to 0. And from the second property, I know that the sigma n is n0 over 2. Sigma n squared is n0 over 2. So this simplifies as 1 over square root of 2 pi. Sigma n squared is n0 over 2. So sigma n is square root of n0 over 2 e to the minus nk squared over 2 n0 over 2. And this simplifies one more as 1 over square root of <coughs> pi n0 e to the minus nk squared over So that's the probability density function of the noise in, in this, in this uh, uh, at this point here. So if you look at it, the noise as it is distributed east-west, you can think of it as being this way. It will have a zero mean around this point, and it will have the uh, standard deviation that's proportional sigma n proportional to square root of n0 over 2. 
And the same thing happens along this direction. You have the noise that is zero mean, and then sigma n here is also proportional to n0 over 2. And you can see now the more noise you have, the more spread you have here, and then this sphere here becomes, or this uh, <coughs> cloud becomes wider and wider. Okay? Uh, any questions on this? Go ahead, please. Is it uh, sigma squared equal to n0 over 2? So yeah, because this is a, a cross correlation, right? So it's when k is equal to n, this is expected value of nk squared. I'm looking expected, I'm looking at the second mode, right? So and that's equal to n0 over 2. So, so I'm just curious, along, along, um, along the y axis, what is the value of, uh, of sigma n change? It doesn't. What, what do you mean? Well, square root of the square root n0 over 2 before y. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. square root n. So, oh, okay. So type of type. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's, it's the same. It's the same. This is a spherical. That's the whole whole conclusion that we're drawing here. There is no, you know, if, uh, how would it not be spherical? Let's say, what would that imply? Let's say that the noise is, and then let me use a different color because I don't want uh, this to go to be maybe confused. Let's say the, the same guy is throwing a dart, but this is the noise, right? So what do I conclude here? I conclude that there is that these two noise components are not independent, right? If the, if the noise along this direction is here, chances are the noise along the other direction is here too, right? They depend, right? So there's a correlation between two noises. If there is some bias, then uh, uh, if the non-zero, let's say his, uh, as he gets drunk, this mean here is not preserved, then he's throwing the dart, but he's always hitting here, <coughs> right? So here I have uncorrelated noises along two directions, but there's a mean, right, in both directions that offsets his, his throwing, right? Or in, the, in, a, in a, you know, it may be actually something that looks like this. So here you have bias in both mean and correlation between the noise components. None of that is true. In, a, in, a, in a, this model here, you're actually just surrounding this true point and it's a centroid of this thing. But as you're throwing and you, as you become more and more uh, corrupted by noise, this cloud becomes bigger and bigger. And as a result, it starts you know, uh, going outside of what you would assign to this particular symbol. If you throw uh, a dart or, or if you send a symbol, it ends up being here, right? But the next signal uh, available in your constellation is this point here you make an only decision. You can say, well, it's not this point that's been sent, but it's this point that's been sent, right? So, so that's the, what we are after, right? What is the probability of that happening? And you can see that even, even intuitively, this will depend on how your constellation looks like, what is the distance between the symbol, what is the energy of your symbol relative to the noise that you have, right? So that's what we need to quantify. Any other co comments? So let me formally define uh, how do we calculate probability of error, and uh, and then we're going to go ahead and carry the process for the pulse amplitude modulation, the, the simplest uh, case that we have. So let me summarize what we uh, know by now. Here's our, and I'm going to give you the examples in two-dimensional space. You can try to extrapolate this in multi-dimensional space, but uh, you know, two-dimensional is the one that I can draw on both. So this is the position of SM. This is the what existed at the transmitter, right? This is what was received, right? And this is uh, the error that is caused by noise, right? When I'm, uh, actually it's the other way around, sorry. <coughs> so this R symbol is seen as your SM 
original symbol plus what has been corrupted by nodes. We have, uh, we can write this in, a, this is a vector, but we can write it in a scale. A component along this direction is whatever was the projection of the signal along that direction plus the component of the noise along that direction. The same token component along this direction <coughs> is going to be whatever was signal SM2 plus the noise component along that direction. So this equation, which is, this equation is the same as these two equations, right? The first one is the vector equation, the second one is a <coughs> scalar equation. So that's what we know. The other thing that we know is that NK uh, follows the PDF of NK, which is 1 over square root of pi n0 into the minus NK squared over n0 for k equal to 1 to n, where n is the dimension of your space. In our case, in this drawing here, n is equal to 2, because I have two basis vectors. Uh, to, uh, there are two things that, uh, actually there is one simplifying assumption that uh, I'm going to introduce here to facilitate our probability of error calculation. You will see that simplifying assumption uh, is relatively easy to make. In the digital communication, you will actually see that this is not much of a simplification because we make sure that this is the case. And then I need to define the metric in this new system. So first, simplifying assumption that I'm going to make I'm going to say that the probability of symbol S1 is the same as probability of symbol S2 and so on is equal to the probability of symbol SM which is 1 over M. What is it that I'm saying? If I have M symbols in my constellation then it's the same probability that I'm sending any one of them, right? That's a, that's a reasonable assumption in digital communication because we want uh, that to be the case. If you have your QPSK with four symbols then symbol 1, symbol 2, symbol 3, and symbol 4 should be sent approximately the same amount of time. Now, that doesn't happen on its own. We actually do some processing on the transmitter side to make sure that that's the case. But in almost all communication systems, we actually do this processing. So it's a realistic from our, uh, from our analysis here. To give you an understanding why we have to introduce this assumption, think about, again, language about you know, uh, about, uh, let's say, written text. This assumption is saying the probability of all letters is the same. And you can see that that's not a realistic assumption. In English language, what is the most probable letter, you know? Which one? A. A, uh, you're close, but it's not A. It's letter E. E is the most probable letter. So. So what we do is we actually don't like that to be happening in our communication system and we do some encoding that's called, that's called the entropy encoding or source encoding where we make sure that all symbols are of the same probability. This will simplify our probability of error calculation, right? The second thing uh, that uh, I need to uh, cover here is what is the way how I make the decision, right? And uh, the the decision-making process is, again, something that uh, can be done differently, but I'm going to use the simplest one. And the simplest one is going to be like this. I'm going to observe this point in the space associated with these uh, constellations, and I'm going to assign that point to the constellation point that is the closest in the Euclidean sense. Right? So in other words, if I have, let's say, these four points in my constellation, and this is where the guy happened to be throwing the dart. I'm going to calculate some sort of distance between this point and all points of your constellation. And I'm going to say, OK, given my assumptions of noise and everything, that this is actually this symbol, because it's the closest to that symbol. Right? So decision-making process in action is assign R 
to the closest constellation space. Constellation point, sorry. So the, the closest point in your signal space to whatever you receive, right? And that's uh, also kind of a uh, very common way of doing it and very easy to understand, right? So to decide which point is the closest, we can have several metrics. And let me give you those metrics, starting from the one that comes straight from here. This is Euclidean distance. And then you can see that we can simplify that metric uh, for different uh, scenarios. So, so let me first look at that metric. So this would be, let's say, A, where I'm going to say the distance between R and SM is going to be calculated as a norm of R minus SM. Right? This is, uh, and I'm going to actually say norm squared. So this is the square of the distance. I'm using the metric that is the square of the distance. Why do I use square of the distance? Because I don't need, I don't want to take the square root because it just consumes the computation time. And if square is larger, the square root is larger too. So it doesn't give me any, any uh, new uh, insight. Right? So I'm going to take r, I'm going to compute the square of the distance for every point in my constellation. And I'm going to say, OK, please, the transmitter has sent the point for which this is the smallest. Right? That's, the, that's the assumption that uh, I'm going to make. This, uh, in practice, we're going to calculate this as sum when k goes from 1 to n, r k minus s n k squared. Right? So remember, these r k's are already produced uh, by the demodulator. Uh, these are the outputs of my match filter. So I already have these numbers. These numbers I already know. This is this is what the transmitter has been sending. I know there's just uh, some number of these that are possible candidates, so I can readily compute this method. There are other equivalent expressions here. So let me work on <coughs> a couple of other metrics that would give me the same results in terms of the decision making process but will be computationally less intense. Uh, if I look at this D of R S M, I can work on this and this becomes sum k equals to 1 through n R k squared minus 2 R k S M k plus S M k squared, right? This summation. But uh, this I can write as sum <coughs> k equals to 1 and r k squared minus 2 sum when k goes from 1 to n r k times s m k and plus sum when k goes from 1 to n s m k squared. Now, from the decision making process, uh, let me actually just uh, rewrite this a little bit more uh, compact. So the first thing is the norm of your vector r, right? Norm, norm squared. The second is 2 times r in dot product with sn. And the last one is your sn norm squared. Now, if I'm trying to make a decision, you can see that really what I'm changing in this expression here is I'm testing various sn's, right? I'm saying, what is my distance to the S1? What is my distance to S2, distance to S3, and so on? However many symbols I have in my constellation. In each test, this part is always the same, right? That's a norm of R. That is the same regardless of what SM. Therefore, it, 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 it does not change anything, right? It just provides a VC offset to all of my distances. Therefore, I cannot, I, I don't have to calculate this one, right? So I can define a different metric that I'm going to find uh, called D prime of R and SM. And I can just have minus 2 times, or, or rather, let me just say 2 times R transpose times SM <laughs> minus SM squared. And while I was trying to minimize this one, so it's minimize 
P. Here I'm going to say maximize V prime. So how do I make a decision? I take my R and I take the dot product with SM and I subtract SM uh, norm squared. And I'm, I can compute this for all of my symbols. Whichever one has the largest value here is the one that the transmitter has sent. Why am I minimizing this one and maximizing this one? Do you see that? Because I flip the sign. Right? So I'm, I'm still minimizing this one. But if I minimize this one, I'm at the same time maximizing this one because of the negative sign. Right? I flipped it, this became plus, and this became minus. Right? So the <coughs> maximum of this occurs when, uh, when the minimum of this distance occurs when this one is maximum. And then the last one, metric that is also commonly used, if the norm of f m squared is constant, when would that happen? When do my symbols have constant norms? Can you give me an example of the modulation scheme? What does need to happen for them to have the constant norm? The norm squared is what? is the same as energy, right? So if all of my uh, symbols have the same energy, what can I say about them? Where are they located? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're all on a unit circle, right? That's they have the same energy. So in the case of, let's say, QPSK or, B, or BPSK or any of the PSK modulation schemes, this is satisfied, PSK. <coughs> Then this term here is the same regardless of what the symbol I'm evaluating, right? So I don't have to compute this term. So I end up with another metric, C, R, and SM, which is just the dot product between R and SM. So this one is the easiest to evaluate. You just take the dot product of R and all the symbols in your constellation and this is a measure of similarity, how close you are to the point. So the largest this one is, the uh, closer you are to the constellation point, and you make the decision that this is the constellation point that has been set. All of these metrics are used. The most commonly, you know, you use this one because it's simpler than this one. It gives you the same result. And then if you have uh, uh, the same energy, which uh, is the case in all PSK modulation schemes, and this becomes the metric of choice. So now I have all the ingredients that allow me to define what the probability of error is, formally, or how do I calculate probability of error. <coughs> I'm going to start before we get again uh, involved in a, some uh, math here. What I'm going to do is let me start with a simple uh, example to illustrate what, what we are doing here. So let's say I have uh, two dimensional signaling, and for the sake of this example, I'm going to use QPSK. So I have four uh, symbols in my constellation here. This is my psi one, psi two. As we have seen before, psi one is usually the I component with cosine. Psi two is the Q component with sine. This is S one. This is S two, S three, S four. Now let's uh, consider a transmitter sending S one. What is it that I'm receiving? I'm receiving all you know points that are kind of being scattered around this S1. The formally to calculate the probability of error, I'm going to define something that I'm going to call decision boundary. And this is, in this case, decision boundary is going to follow this axis, essentially indicating my first quadrant. And here's the statement that I'm going to make. I'm going to call this R1, which is a decision region for S1. And I'm going to make a statement like this. If your R 
falls within R1, then my decision is that it has been S1 then for sent. Okay? So I look at where R is, and then I say, okay, if it is within this R1, then that's, I, I've been sending S. If it is outside of this R1, then my decision is I'm going to pick one of these three other symbols. But as long as R comes within this region here, then uh, my decision is that it has been S1 that was sent. So now, uh, let's uh, consider what does probability density function of R given Sn looks like, right? So what is this? This is a distribution of R components under the condition that particular symbol has been sent. So what is it that I'm after? I'm after this, the mathematical description for this distribution here, right? This, how does it look like? It's a, this bell curve that comes out of the board, right? That's a, that tells me how are the points distributed under the condition that I'm sending um, this symbol SN. Uh, based on our analysis before, I have that this distribution looks like this product. This is uh, this symbol here means products. When um, let me make sure that I use the same notation on the screen. Products when k goes one through n, n is the dimension of the of the space. <coughs> PDF of R k provided that S and K has been sent. What I'm saying here is I'm using the fact that the noise is distributed independently along each one of the directions. <coughs> Therefore, the joint probability distribution here is product of the marginal probability distributions. I'm going to get this joint distribution as product of the distributions along every one of the coordinates. And uh, given that I know the shape of this one, so this becomes product when k goes from 1 through n, 1 over square root of pi and 0, e to the minus nk squared, um, sorry, r minus rk minus snk squared over n. <coughs> so that's the distribution along each one of the coordinates. Essentially, this RK minus SMK is NK, right? The noise component NK. And uh, this distribution we just derived uh, previous board, this is the distribution of the noise. Because the noise is causing that, uh, uh, the scatter of these components around uh, the constellation symbol. And now I can say, OK, probability defined R and C as a complement of decision region R M. So for this one, I define the decision decision region R one, which is the region where I'm going to assign S one to this R. The complement, which means everything outside, is R one. C, right? And then based on this, I can define the probability of error given that SM has been sent is going to be an integral over this complement region of your PDF <coughs> of R given SM D. Right. So that's simply. Uh, uh, <coughs> probability of error. So what is it that I'm doing? Let's just step for a moment, stop for a moment and explain the physics behind the symbol. Going back to my uh, dart throwing drum gun, right? He's throwing the darts and then there is a cloud of points where he's hitting. That cloud is centered around the <coughs> where it should be and it kind of gr grows you know, becomes more and more dispersed as uh, the, the noise becomes larger or as the thrower becomes more drunk. Probability of error, uh, so you can think of this as having a probability density function 
where the kind of stands out of this board, it's a two-dimensional uh, function that maps every point in this entire plane with the probability of uh, density for that particular point. Probability of error is going to be the uh, volume underneath this surface that is outside of this decision bound. As long <coughs> as I hit, as he said, that he uh, hits any point within R1, I'm going to make a correct decision. But as soon as he hits any point outside of R1, which is within R1 complement, I'm going to make erroneous decision. So probability of making erroneous decision is volume underneath this probability density function that is outside of the correct decision bound, which is this Rm complement. And then I'm integrating the area under, under this, this uh, multidimensional PDF. Now, that's the probability of having an error when I'm sending SM. The average probability, error probability, is the average of this quantity when the average is taken across all possible symbols. So you can think of probability of error as sum when uh, uh, m goes 1 to m, probability of sm times the probability of error given that sm has been sent. So that's, a, that's how I calculate the average probability of error. Uh, because of our simplified assumptions, these probabilities are all the same. And they are 1 over m. Right? We're assuming that all symbols are exactly probable, so we're going to take this outside, and I get that the probability of error is going to be 1 over m sum, and m goes from 1 to m, probability of error given sm. That's the average probability of error. And then I can uh, kind of put this in here, so this becomes 1 over m sum, when m goes from 1 to m, integral over rm complement pdf <coughs> of r given sm dr. Or another way to write this is instead of integrating over complement, I can integrate over the correct region, which is 1 minus integral over rm. <coughs> of R given SM. Okay. In this case, I'm saying the average probability of error is the average of individual probabilities of error. But individual probability of error, I can say this is one minus probability of making a correct decision. Right? Probability of making a correct decision is the volume underneath the PDF that is within this uh, right, uh, correct decision error. Now this expression here, that's it. Okay, that's the definition of the probability of how we calculate probability of error. Conceptually, it's really easy, right? I mean, uh, if you if you got it and, and you feel well, it, it seems like it should be more complicated. It's not. It's very easy what we're trying to do, right? We, we derive the probability density function, and this is the distribution of where these points are. And all I'm trying to calculate is probability of falling outside of the correct decision-making region. And that, th this is my probability of error. And this is kind of formally summarized mathematically <coughs> in this expression here. Now, what, where it becomes tricky is when you start applying this, then you may run into some, uh, you know, just uh, mathematical complexity. Right? It may be easier or, or, or more difficult to calculate these. But again, as I was saying several times, calculation of integrals is in, in principle the easy thing to do, right? If you have, unless you are in the exam scenario, right, where you're pressured for time and uh, you are most of the time condemned to do everything. <coughs> if you do this, you know, 
for a living or you do this in a, in a work scenario, then uh, you kind of use either simulations or you use numerical you know, uh, calculations or sometimes you can actually do it analytically and we're going to do that example in just a second. But conceptually, this is where all the theory ends. And we have many, many different modulation schemes and untold numbers of how they work and how you modulate, demodulate, and so on. But when we calculate the probability of error, this is what we're doing every single time. Right? And, uh, and uh, the result we get, we summarize in what we call performance curves. So what I'm going to do here is illustrate this whole process in the, uh, on our simplest case, which is pulse amplitude modulation. It is one dimensional case, so um, so you know the results are uh, going to be everything is going to collapse on a, just one straight line. There will be no second vector here, but uh, we'll kind of try to go through the motions and follow this this approach here and see where it leads us. So let's uh, look at the, how you calculate the probability of error in pulse amplitude modulation. Any questions here? Okay. So probability modulation, uh, and I'm going to approach this in two steps. I'm going to first look at binary pulse amplitude modulation because we're fresh to the subject and uh, I want to use the simplest of all possible modulation schemes, right? And then we're going to generate, uh, we're going to generalize this to uh, uh, MI. So here we have two symbols. SM of T is going to be equal AM square root of single energy times psi of t. There is only <coughs> one psi, right? It's a one dimensional scheme, right? So it's, uh, it's only one um, psi. And this m is going to be either 1 or 2. You have a binary pump, so you're having either plus square root of energy times psi of t or minus square root of energy times psi of t. So those two uh, possibilities. This psi of t is going to be 1 over square root of energy times some g t of t, right? Where g t of t is the pulse shape. What are we talking about here? Just to refresh your memory, you are sending either binary, you're sending either plus or minus some pulse. <coughs> In most circumstances, this pulse is going to be from minus t over 2 to t over 2 and it's going to be slightly rounded, right? You're never going to try to signal with square waves because square waves have infinite band, right? So this may be your GT of T. So if I have plus one to send, I send this. If I have minus one to send, I send the opposite, uh, the opposite pulse. So I'm kind of sending these pulses to represent my, my uh, ones and zeros. So uh, my system looks like this. You have a transmitter. Here's where you pick your SM of T, where you know this formalism that I'm going to go through may seem as an overkill, right? and it is for the simplest case, right? Because now I'm talking vectors and I have only one vector, right? So that may be over look at overly complex, but it's important for us to follow because all the time for more complicated scenarios, we're going to follow <coughs> the same process here. So it's easier to track when there's less of the dimensions. Here is N of T corrupting your signal. Here's my uh, demodulator. Now, since this is a one dimensional signaling, I'm going to have only one vector, right? And this vector is going to be either correlator yeah, or it's going to be maxed filter but regardless what it is it's going to produce a single number at the up right 
So here is I'm going to have a uh, number r, and then I'm going to pass this to detect detector to decide SM hat, which one of possible SM symbols have been sent. Um, so if you were uh, to look at now, uh, um, I guess uh, in general, this uh, AM here can be A1 is, for example, 1, A2 is minus 1. Those two guys over here. So your SM1 is just going to be your GT of T, this plus pulse, and then your SM2 is going to be minus GT of T, negative pulse. So I'm sending either positive pulse or a negative pulse. How does my demodulator look like in this case? This is this block here. What does this block need to do? It needs to take a dot product of an incoming signal against my basis vector. So the modulator will have SM of T coming in with added white Gaussian noise. And it's going to take, I'm going to say now here, psi of T. It's going to multiply the incoming signal and integrate from 0 to T. What is it doing? It's taking a dot product between psi of t and SM of t plus n of t. I'm implementing this as a correlating receiver here, but in general it can be a matched filter as well. Right? We saw that mathematically matched filter and correlating receiver perform the same operation. The result of this at kt time when I sample the output is going to be a single value r that is going to be just a number. And based on this number, I would have to decide, did I send this or did I send this? So let's take a look at this r. r is going to be an integral from 0 to t, sm of t plus n of t <coughs> times psi of t dt. This is straightforward from, uh, uh, from this uh, block diagram. Well, if I uh, do a little bit uh, of work here, this becomes 0 to t, sm of t, times psi of t, dt, plus integral from 0 to t, n of t, times psi of t, dt. And uh, if I now substitute what sm of t is going to be, this is integral from 0 to t, SM of t is this, AM square root of energy uh, times psi of t. So I can uh, say that this is 1 over square root of energy times GT of t. Why? Because psi of t is this, GT, plus integral from 0 to t. Uh, n of t times 1 over square root of energy times g e of t d t. Okay? So that's what uh, this r consists of. And uh, Function on a on an interval zero to t, 
and then dot product between two functions. Remember, g1 of t and g2 of t functions on interval i. Then the dot product between these two, g1 of t and dot product with g2 of t, was defined as integral over interval i, g1 of t times g2 of t, complex conjugate dt. That's our definition of the dot product between two functions on the interval i. Both noise and uh, this signal uh, and this function gt of t both exist on, on this interval 0 to t. So the dot product between them, I take the first one times the psi, second one, and I integrate from 0 to t. So that's the dot product. The result of this integration is going to be a single number. It's going to be the noise component. Right? All right, so, and I'm doing the same here. I have my signal SM of T. Uh, oh, I'm, I'm forgetting something here, right? There is something missing. So SM of T is AM square root of energy times psi of T. So let me, yeah, I'm, I'm forgetting one G of T here. Let me. Just uh, thank you for for asking, Jason, because you always ask something where I mess up here. On the <laughs> so it's zero to t. Let's substitute SM of t. It's AM square root of energy times psi of t, and I can uh, uh, or I can substitute right away psi of t as one over square root of energy times uh, gt of t. Okay. And um, <coughs> then I take again psi of t, which is 1 over square root of energy times uh, gt of t dt. Right. So I have here sm, and then I have here psi. So this will... Uh, this will uh, give me uh, what, what the, so you're going to have here the output R, but R will have two components. It will have one that is due to signal, and it will have one that's due to noise. <coughs> right? So I can write here that uh, this R is going to be, now look at this, square, square root of n, these two cancel. So I have 1 over square root of energy outside and AM outside. So this is AM divided by 1 over square root of energy. Integral from 0 to T, GT square root T, GT. And then plus, um, I can say again, 1 over square root of energy, 0 to T, GT. So this is the signal part, and this is noise. And uh, I can even simplify this, because this is nothing but the energy of this pulse, right? So this is energy divided by square root of energy. So this is A square root of energy of the pulse plus some noise. Right? So this is how my, uh, my uh, R uh, looks like. And then I also know from my previous discussion that noise is a random variable that has the distribution 1 over square root of pi and 0 <coughs> into the minus n squared over so that's uh, that's my um, my distribution of the noise. Now that's a formally way of, of going through all of these formulas. Here's more uh, I guess way that's a little bit easier to understand. This is your vector psi, right? 
So that's where all of your points in your constellations are going to be. They're all going to be on this single axis. Why? Because it's one dimension, right? The first one is if you look at uh, upstairs, the, it's going to be the, all of your symbols are going to be am square root of energy times psi of t. So your a1, this is your s1, which is going to be a times square root of energy. That's the that's uh, that's the S, uh, S1. S2 is going to be here, which is going to be minus A square root of energy. The distance between these two guys is going to be 2A square root of energy, right? The distance between them. Now, look at my dart throwing guy. This, the dart throwing guy, let's say I'm sending S1, is going to be uh, trying to hit S1. But unlike in the example I gave you before, uh, the, the points are going to scatter only along this psi 1, right? Because it's a one-dimensional signal. So all the noise that is outside is irrelevant, right? So the, most of the time, he's going to be hitting here. But then sometimes, he's going to hit a little bit further. And sometimes, he's going to pick it even uh, more away. And every now and then he will hit, you know, here. So if you look at distribution of these points, distribution is like this. This is your PDF of R given S1 has been set. Right? So if S if S <coughs> transmitter is sending S1, I'm receiving the points mostly along this portion of the line, but they're going to be distributed. Uh, this way. The, on average, they're going to be around this one, but their scatter here is going to be square root of n0 over 2, proportional to the square root of n0 over 2. Right? This is this expression uh, for noise. It's just that now you're adding this equal point in this one. And then if S2 is, has been sent, then you're going to have the distribution that looks like this. On the <coughs> first, I'm sending S2, but here also there will be a scatter that's proportional to N0 over 2. Where is the decision boundary here? Zero. Here. Is it this line? No. It is just the point. Right? Why? Because line makes no sense. It's one dimensional signal. So if R is right of this point, I'm going to make a decision that it is S1 that has been sent. If R that I receive is left of this point, my decision is going to be that S2 has been sent. And then the probability of error, in my case <coughs> here, becomes probability of sending S1 times the probability of error given that S1 has been sent, plus probability of sending S2 times the probability of error that I make given that S2 has been sent. That's my average probability of error. Okay. Now, I introduce my simplifying assumption what is the probability of S1? 0. 0.5, right? I'm sending half of the symbols are these, half of the symbols are these. So it's one half probability of error given S1 plus one half probability of error given S2. Now, if in, in this case I have a symmetric pulse amplitude modulation, so you know, everything is symmetric relative to the origin. So these two probabilities are going to be the same. Do you see that? I'm essentially looking at this, ex extend these tails, probability of error given S2 has been sent is the area under the curve that is right from zero in this distribution. Probability of error given that S1 has been sent is the same tail here but extending you know, from this distribution, right? 
And they are the same because everything is <coughs> symmetric with respect to origin. So I can just say that this I get the same result as probability of error saying that S1 has been sent because two uh, halves or something that's the same is one point. Okay. So now the question is what, what is the probability of error given that uh, S1 has been sent? say it's the, as always, it's the, the integral over the complement, R1 complement, of the PDF of R given that S1 has been sent to Y. In our case, this becomes an integral from minus infinity to zero. That's a complement, right? That's the erroneous part, because if I look at here, the probability of making, when I'm sending this one, the probability of making error is area under the PDF that is outside of the proper decision making boundary. So it's integral when R goes, uh, let me say what, uh, R goes from minus infinity to uh, zero. One over square root of pi and zero e to the minus R minus SM one squared over and zero b right so that's the area under the normal curve that is outside of the correct decision making bound now uh, this is uh, uh, relatively easy to calculate uh, in our case sm1 is going to be plus a square root of energy, or just square root of energy, because we're assuming that a is equal to one. So this becomes an integral when r goes from minus infinity to zero, one over square root of pi and zero into the minus r minus square root of energy squared over n zero. Dr. How do we calculate the area under normal distribution? We introduce, we go through two steps. First step is normalization and then we use a table. So in the first step, I'm going to uh, introduce substitution. And x is going to be always whatever it is, <coughs> minus square root of mean divided by standard deviation. Standard deviation here is n0 over 2. Okay. That's uh, my substitution. So under this substitution, probability of error, given that S1 has been sent, I write an integral, and then I can immediately write normalized normal PDF here. Right? So this becomes 1 over square root of 2 pi e to the minus x squared over 2 dx. And all I need to worry is about boundaries. So when r is minus infinity, where is x? When r is minus infinity, where is x? Minus infinity is one. And when r is equal to 0, where is x? So two times square root of n square root of energy uh, over n zero, right? So so x goes from to minus two square root of energy divided by n zero. So that's what I need to integrate, and this is the same. Look what I'm doing. I'm saying this is my normalized, this is what I'm trying to do. This is this minus square root of energy over n zero, two times that. But this is the same as 
this, where this is now square root of 2 times energy. <coughs> Why do I do that? Because Q functions are usually given as upper tails of the normal distribution. So this I'm going to express as integral for from 2 times energy over n0, 2 plus infinity, 1 over square root of 2 pi e to the minus x squared over 2 dx. This function here, upper tail of a normal distribution, is referred to as q function in, in communication. So we define q of z as an integral from z to plus infinity, 1 over square root of 2 pi e to the minus x squared over 2 dx. This one is uh, this one is tabulated, you know, in your book, and I think it's given on a page hundred and uh, hundred fifty-two. How do you know? Does it say here? You mentioned it before. I mentioned it before. Okay. So this one is uh, this one is tabulated. So if you look at it here, we get that the probability of error in uh, in QPSK or binary pen is equal to square root of Q over square root of 2 epsilon G energy of your pulse divided by N0. But the energy of the pulse is the same as the energy of your symbol because your symbol is sending either plus pulse or negative pulse. So I can say that this is Q over 2 times epsilon S over N0. And this 2 times epsilon s over n0 is good friend of ours. How do we call this? This is an output signal to noise ratio for the matched field. So I can say that the probability of error here is q times q of square root of 2, uh, or just signal to noise ratio, and the of the matched field. Surprisingly simple result after all this. It kind of tells you none of this needs to be calculated, right? You apply your mesh filter, you know what the what the output is, two times epsilon s over n zero. So if you know your your signal at the input, you can calculate its energy. This goes here, and power spectral density of your uh, noise is given n zero. You plug that into Q function and you get probability of error. So very simple result. Now, it is customary to put these results in a form of a graph. On an on a x-axis, we usually give this um, epsilon, over, epsilon s over n0, or usually what is called energy per bit over power spectral density. Let me see here. Let me just write it epsilon s over n0. And we actually usually express this in 10 log of that. So we express this in dv. And on the y-axis, we give probability of error. And this scale is usually log scale. Right? So you're going to have here uh, 0 0.1, 0 0.01, 0 0.001. Uh, 0.0001 0 and so on. So 10 to the minus 1, 10 to the minus 2, 10 to the minus 3 and so on. And then you get a, a graph that might look somewhat like this. Because of their shape that uh, always looks like this, right? And it's kind of easy to explain why it looks like this. Because as your signal to noise ratio increases, your probability of error decreases. Uh, these are called waterfall curves. And they are equivalent to the signal to noise ratio curves in the analog receivers. These are the curves that come as attached to the modulation scheme that tells you the performance <coughs> of the modulation scheme in AWGM. It tells you if you know certain uh, uh, signal to noise ratio here, or e, uh, your 10 log over ES over N0 then I can tell you what your probability of error is going to be for that 
that condition. Right? Uh, in uh, case of uh, BPSK, uh, this uh, Um, okay. Uh, okay, so this is epsilon s over n zero. So this quantity here, epsilon s over n zero, I'm going to refer to as, as gamma. And then, for example, in this case, for uh, four dB, you are here. All right. So this is around four dB then probability of error for about 70 is 10 to the minus 3 and so on. So this gives you probability of error. Okay. Now, uh, let me give you just a picture and uh, we're going to stop here. So how do you extend this for a uh, higher level modulation scheme, like <coughs> higher level pulse amplitude modulation. So let's say M are in uh, M level pump modulation scheme, you're going to have M different value. This is going to be S1, S2, and so on. S, M minus 1, S, M. M minus 2, right? So you're sending now your, uh, your symbols, you're going to be receiving uh, symbols anywhere on this axis. You can think of uh, distribution now around every one of these symbols based on your, any, on your uh, uh, noise. So you're going to have distributions like this. And then you're looking, okay, if I'm sending this symbol here, what is the probability of making an error? Well, it's going to be this. And then let's say there's another one here. So this, right? So you can calculate the probability for every one of them. And then <coughs> average is going to be probability is going to be average of all individual probabilities. And this is done in your book and it's done in uh, previous notes. But uh, let me give you how this result might look like. So in this case, probability of error is going to be 2 times m minus 1 over m. Again, Q function, six times log two of M divided by M squared minus one times gamma. Right, so that's how you would determine the probability of error in memory path, where this gamma is gonna be your N energy per symbol divided by and zero, and then times k here, where k is log two. Right. And if you look at this, is yet again another waterfall curve that will give you, you know, the probability of error for any given noise ratio. And then, depending on the modulation scheme, you can you get all sorts of different curves that are like this that give you probability of error. But the calculation of all of these follows the same process that we just went through. Right? You, would, you would put all of these PDFs, then carefully calculate probability of making individual errors, and at the end you would average everything on, uh, for all the symbols. Any questions? Okay, so let's stop here, let's have a break, and then when we come back I'm going to go through sample problems and we're going to discuss the, the findings.